presume that your presence here tonight means that Noam Chomsky needs no introduction. You know who he is, and that's why you're here. All the same, I think I need to comment briefly on the unique person that he is. There is no other internationally renowned linguist in the US who has been such an outspoken critic of the US state, and particularly its foreign policy over the last 30 years. At the same time, there is no other internationally famous critic of the US state who is at the same time such an internationally respected linguist. It is a measure of the man's uniqueness that he can draw 500 people to a linguistics lecture at the University of Ulster on Tuesday night and, what, 350, 400 here to a political meeting in West Belfast tonight. However, there are some who would point to this combination of interests as a way of disparaging Noam Chomsky. They hint that he would be a much better academic if he would only stay away from such extremist politics, that somehow he is less acceptable as a linguist because of his outspoken and independent criticisms. To hint that is the first step in marginalizing Chomsky, pushing him beyond the pale of respectability and acceptability. I'm not exaggerating here. The man who can draw large crowds to his political meetings in numerous parts of the world, who has probably directly addressed more students in the US than any other living person, is usually ignored by mainstream television networks in the US, and his books are usually not reviewed in the major US newspapers, not even the more liberal ones. Ladies and gentlemen, Noam Chomsky. There's a standard view of the current moment of world history. Uh, it's so familiar that it doesn't need elaborate uh, citations. Uh, the major idea is that history is converging towards an ideal of liberal democracy and uh, class classical free markets, which are some sometimes even called the end of history. Uh, this will be the triumph of the principles of Adam Smith and uh, Thomas Jefferson and other libertarian heroes. Uh, a second related thought is that we have just emerged from a cosmic struggle, the Cold War, uh, in which these ideals have uh, been triumphant and vindicated. And uh, we are now therefore entering uh, a new world order in which uh, what we say goes as George Bush put it proudly during the Gulf War, and what we say, he added, is that the nations uh, of the world uh, are drawn together under American leadership to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom, and the rule of law. Uh, well, these recall that these impressive words were proclaimed while yet another third world country was being smashed to bits for the crime of disobedience. Uh, that was precisely the crime of Saddam Hussein, who remained a great friend and ally of Douglas Hurd, George Bush, and all the rest, as long as he was just torturing dissidents and gassing Kurds. Uh, uh, I won't uh, illustrate these standard views at length, but just to select a few typical examples almost at random. Uh, the New York Times proclaims that America's victory in the Cold War was a victory for a set of principles, democracy and free markets. The world has learned that these are the wave of the future, a future for which America is both the gatekeeper and the model. In the Gulf War, uh, George Bush was uh, guided by a solemn principle, namely the sanctity of international borders. Uh, educated opinion quite generally agrees. Uh, so take, for example, a highly respected uh, uh, study, scholarly study of the Gulf War by two University of London professors, just appeared, uh, Lawrence Friedman and Ephraim Karsh. Uh, they opened by praising, I'm quoting them, praising the scope and originality of our analysis uh, and its high level of scholarship. And from this august pinnacle, uh, they explain that the United States and the United Kingdom fought in the Gulf to uphold the rule of law in international relations. Uh, George Bush was a crusader for the cause of international norms of, de of decency. 
Uh, there is, in fact, a huge uh, clamor in the West chanting similar odes to our magnificence. Uh, Self-adulation is not a commodity that's uh, uh, in short supply among the uh, powerful and the privileged, uh, but there are peaks, and we're at the moment at one of the triumphalist peaks. Uh, well, the reality that we see around us uh, looks a bit different from all of this. Uh, first, as far as democracy and free markets are concerned, uh, they're considered a threat uh, by the rich and the powerful. Uh, they're considered a danger to be overcome. Uh, the Cold War was real enough, but it should be understood in quite different terms, I think. And as for the rule of law, uh, the guiding principle of the famous New World Order, uh, it requires a certain amount of audacity to take its guardian to be the only head of state in the world who stands condemned before the International Court of Justice uh, for uh, conducting uh, international terrorism, uh, this meaning on a vast scale, wholesale international terrorism, not the retail kind that uh, makes the front pages, uh, namely his terrorist attack against Nicaragua. The judgment of the World Court was, of course, rejected with utter contempt uh, by the United States and its allies. Uh, this same uh, crusader for international law opened the post-Cold War era by invading Panama, uh, vetoing two Security Council resolutions uh, with the help of Britain, uh, installing a client regime that can only be maintained in power with American guns, as Washington fully realizes, uh, and who then uh, reacted to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait a few months later uh, in fear that his old friend Saddam Hussein uh, might mimic what Bush had just achieved in Panama uh, unless the United States and the United Kingdom moved quickly to block the threat of uh, negotiated withdrawal, uh, facts which are incidentally conceded even by the most extreme apologists, uh, professors Friedman and Karsh, for example. Uh, the actual reality <coughs> was expressed a bit more accurately by Winston Churchill uh, with his customary lucidity uh, when he was describing the New World Order of the day in 1945. And he wrote as follows, uh, the government of the world must be entrusted to the satisfied nations who wish nothing more for themselves than what they have, not to the hungry nations who only cause trouble. Uh, it must, the government of the world must be entrusted to rich men dwelling at peace within their habitations. Our power placed us above the rest, and it is our right to rule, uh, a right demanded by the rich men at home as well. Well, that was in 1945. Churchill was outlining a vision to be attained. Uh, now it's hoped it's a reality to be enjoyed by the rich men dwelling at peace within their more than ample hab habitations, uh, busily pursuing what Adam Smith called the vile maxim of the masters of mankind, all for ourselves, nothing for anyone else. Uh, that being the real motto of the New World Order. Actually, it's, it's valuable to pay some attention to uh, uh, the heroes that we're uh, taught to uh, revere, say Adam Smith and Thomas Jefferson, uh, paying attention to the reality, that is, not to the caricature, caricature that's created by ideologists. They actually had a lot to say, uh, a lot that applies today with considerable accuracy, in my opinion. So for Adam Smith, the framework of world order, writing in 1776, the framework of world order was Europe's conquest of the world, what today is called the North-South confrontation, euphemistically. Uh, and Europe's conquest of the world, as he described it, uh, did not provide a very pretty picture. Uh, as he wrote, the savage injustice of the Europeans, uh, primarily the English, and their monopoly of violence brought dreadful misfortunes uh, to those whom they conquered and the lands that they ravaged. The results, he said, were highly beneficial to the conquerors. They laid the basis for England's emergence as a world leader of industry and empire. Uh, but uh, even in the home countries, uh, Smith continues, only some benefited. Primarily, I'm quoting him now, 
primarily the merchants and the financiers who were the principal architects of policy uh, and whose interests were uh, peculiarly attended to, as he put it, uh, but not the farmers, uh, the, the urban workers, uh, the poor, uh, the great mass of the population. They did not suffer the dreadful misfortunes of the third world, uh, but any benefits they gained were incidental or the results of their own uh, struggles at home. Uh, Smith, in 1776, presented what we would nowadays call a class analysis of empire, uh, and it doesn't make, take much imagination to apply the same analysis elsewhere, including Ireland. Well, as his remarks on the vile maxim of the masters indicate, Adam Smith was no admirer of free market capitalism. Uh, if the vile maxim is allowed free reign, he wrote, uh, the resulting subordination of labor will turn working people, quoting him, into creatures as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human being to be. Uh, therefore, he continued, in any civilized society, uh, the government must intervene to control the grim workings of the invisible hand. Uh, in fact, the architects of policy didn't need his advice about the dangers of capitalism. They have always, uh, from early England up till today, they have always called upon state power to protect them from the destructive effects of the free market, uh, just as Adam Smith described. Uh, as for Thomas Jefferson and other 18th century libertarians, uh, they were opposed to absolute power, uh, power which is not accountable to the general public. Now, in their day, uh, the absolute power that they saw around them and therefore confronted or called for confronting was the absolutist state, the church, uh, the feudal system, slavery with some ambiguity. Uh, they did not observe uh, a later development, namely industrial capital capitalism with its unprecedented centralized and unaccount unaccountable power over uh, investment decisions, uh, production, consumption, commerce, uh, every aspect of life, uh, over resources and so on. Uh, that's a new form of illegitimate power, far beyond anything that was contemplated by the classical libertarians. Uh, and anyone who takes their thinking seriously uh, will be a dedicated opponent of this new form, later form, of unaccountable absolute power, namely modern uh, uh, centrally managed state capitalism, uh, in particular its uh, uh, newer transnational forms, which are even more absolutist in character. Well, let me put these crucial matters to the side for, for a moment. I want to come back to them. And let's take a look at the Cold War. Uh, the origins of the Cold War give a rather good insight into what it was all about which in my opinion is quite different from the standard story, and I think it's revealing to think it through. Uh, let's take the analysis by George Kennan. Kennan, as you know, was one of the leading architects of the world order that was constructed uh, right after the Second World War, uh, but he also happens to be a respected diplomatic historian. Uh, his uh, leading, his major work is a multi-volume study of Soviet-American relations kind of a standard work, uh, and uh, in it, <clears throat> if I can find my notes, which I've naturally lost, uh, in it, uh, Kennan uh, describes the, uh, the origins of the Cold War, uh, which uh, he traces to 1918, January 1918, when the uh, Bolsheviks disbanded the Constituent Assembly. Uh, he uh, writes that that uh, shocking act created the breach with the West with an element of finality. The British ambassador to Russia, Sir George Buchanan, was deeply shocked, Kennan writes, and therefore called for armed intervention uh, to punish the crime. Well, that followed shortly after, and it was taken quite seriously. Uh, for example, the British... Uh, the British Army used poison gas uh, against the Bolsheviks, which was no small matter uh, immediately after the Second World War, the First World War. And that was regarded then as the ultimate atrocity. Uh, Britain, the British historians have yet to uh, 
uh, come to terms with these facts, which were released in the British archives about 15 years ago. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Woodrow Wilson, you know, the great idealist, uh, was particularly distraught by the disbanding of the Constituent Assembly, Kennan writes. Uh, his strong attachment to constitutionality was deeply offended by the sight of a government with no mandate beyond the bayonets of the Red Guard. Uh, well, that's, at that point, the Cold War was underway and unstoppable, January 1918. Uh, actually, history was kind enough in this case to construct a controlled experiment uh, for us to be able to uh, evaluate just how seriously to take all of this impressive rhetoric. A uh, few months after the Bolsheviks committed this great crime that started the Cold War, which has been raging for 70 years, a few months after that, uh, Woodrow Wilson's army disbanded the National Assembly in occupied Haiti uh, using what the uh, Marine Corps uh, colonel in charge, uh, Smedley Butler, called genuinely Marine Corps methods. Uh, the reason was that uh, Haiti, the Haitian National Assembly, had refused to ratify a constitution uh, written by the invaders, which would have allowed U.S. corporations to buy up Haiti's lands and turn the country into a U.S.-owned plantation. Uh, well, that was a problem, but a marine-run plebiscite uh, remedied the problem shortly after. Uh, under Washington's guns, the U.S. written constitution was indeed ratified uh, by 99.9% .9 of the votes, with 5% of the population uh, participating. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt later took credit for this, but uh, falsely, it appears. Uh, gone from what is called history uh, is the restoration of slavery by the Marines, uh, Marine Corps massacres and terror, uh, dismantling of the constitutional system, the takeover by U.S. corporations, which did turn it into a U.S.-owned plantation with consequences that last to today, uh, pretty much as in the uh, Dominican Republic next door, where Wilson's armies were only a shade less destructive because the racist barbarism of the old Indian fighters uh, didn't reach such extreme levels when they were confronting uh, what they called spicks instead of niggers. Uh, also gone is the establishment of the National Guard, a uh, state terrorist force, uh, of a kind familiar elsewhere uh, that has kept its iron grip on the niggers ever since uh, with U.S. support, as in the Dominican Republic and many other places. Uh, I should stress that official U.S. doctrine, now well documented from the declassified record from about 1945, official U.S. doctrine for Latin America is that the security forces must be under the control of the United States. Uh, doesn't matter much what the government is doing. If the security forces are under control, uh, they'll take care of any uh, untoward actions on the part of the uh, civilian authorities. Uh, that was reiterated strongly during the Kennedy administration and by the Kennedy liberals, I should say. Uh, well, as the record since 1918 makes perfectly clear, beginning with this utter deceit at the origins, uh, as the record throughout makes entirely clear, uh, the Cold War had absolutely nothing to do with Soviet crimes uh, or with any Soviet military threat. Uh, the uh, story, the real reasons, are quite different and, in fact, quite familiar. Uh, apart from scale, uh, the whole Cold War falls into place quite naturally as a typical example of the so-called North-South confrontation. Uh, and to see that, it's only necessary to think through the logic of the, of the, of the North-South confrontation, the contemporary stage of Europe's world conquest, the leader of the conquest now being one of the European settled colonies. Uh, think through the logic of it, and it applies quite, quite, quite accurately to the, to the whole history of the Cold War from its origins. Uh, there's a basic principle of world order. The basic principle is that what's called the third world, that is the conquered, conquered regions, uh, the, are to provide a service. They, they, they have a role. It's a service role. Their role is to provide uh, resources, uh, raw materials, uh, cheap labor, markets, uh, investment opportunities, uh, 
uh, nowadays opportunities for export of pollution. Uh, that's their job. This is all entirely explicit in high-level planning documents. No, nothing covered. Uh, now, uh, sometimes something happens which interferes with the, with the service role. Uh, a, a government or a, move, a popular movement will develop or a, or a government will take over which doesn't understand that its pri primary responsibility is to foreign investors and gets the funny idea that it has a responsibility to its own population. Uh, th there's a name for that. It's called radical nationalism or sometimes ultra-nationalism. Uh, and uh, again, in high-level planning documents, we have a very rich declassified record on this. Uh, in the highest level planning documents, uh, we read that the greatest threat to U.S. interests is nationalist regimes, which are responsive to pressures from the masses of the population for improvement in low living standards and diversification of production for domestic needs, it's quoting. Uh, the reason why that's the greatest threat to U.S. interests is entirely obvious. Uh, it interferes with the business climate, with the climate for repatriation of profits, uh, with provision, uh, with, with serving the needs of the uh, 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 primary constituents of any third world government, namely the rich men who were supposed to rule the world, as Churchill put it. Uh, now, it doesn't matter what the political coloration of such ultranationalist regimes may be. It can be anything. Uh, they can be run by mass murderers. Uh, they can be run, they can be influenced by liberation theologists, by, you know, priests organizing peasants, uh, by democratic capitalists, uh, Islamic fundamentalists. Uh, you pick it. Whatever they, they may be makes not the slightest difference. Uh, the problem is that they pursue these completely unacceptable policies of uh, responding to pressures from the masses of, the, of their own population and to their concerns, which means they're obviously not responding to the needs of, uh, of, of the conquerors, uh, the rich men who rule the world by right and need these regions uh, uh, to serve them. They're the servants' quarters and they sometimes get uppity and they have to be put back into place. Uh, now, sometimes they're even worse than ultra-nationalist. Uh, the, uh, they become worse if they appear to be successful. Uh, if they appear to be successful in terms which, have, which uh, provide a suggestive model to others who are suffering from the same conditions, then they graduate a step higher from ultra-nationalist to rotten apple, uh, a rotten apple that's going to spoil the barrel or to a virus that's going to infect the region. Uh, the, now, then comes a divergence. There's a version of this that's presented to the public, and there's a version that's in the internal planning record. To the public, the rotten apple is going to conquer the world. So Grenada, uh, under Maurice Bishop, was a rotten apple, uh, which was going to threaten, literally, it was going to threaten US sea lanes uh, in, in case the Russians invaded uh, uh, Western Europe, Grenada was going to block sea lanes in the Caribbean so that the U.S. wouldn't be able to come to the support of its uh, uh, beleaguered Western European allies and the U.S. would just stand there in total hopelessness, well, <laughs> at the mercy of Grenada. Uh, well, that's the, that's the public, I'm not exaggerating, incidentally, this is exactly true. I'll never forget listening to Rear Admiral Moore, the chief of staff, uh, kind of intoning somberly about this on the radio at the time of the invasion, uh, and leading academics repeated it and so on. <coughs> That's the public version. You know, Ho Chi Minh is going to get into a canoe and land in San Francisco and so on. The more rational version is sometimes clearly expressed. So, for example, when uh, uh, Kissinger and Nixon were about to overthrow the government of Chile, Allende's government, uh, Nick, uh, Kissinger pointed out internally that uh, they were a virus uh, which were going to infect others uh, all the way to Italy. Uh, Kissinger was not a great genius between us, <laughs> but he didn't think that Allende's hordes were going to descend upon Rome. Uh, what he thought was, not implausibly, that the successes of democratic socialism in Chile would just send the wrong message to the Italian voters. This was a time when there was a lot of concern about Eurocommunism, uh, about social democracy in Europe, and uh, this virus couldn't be, uh, couldn't be uh, accepted. Uh, Nicaragua was a virus for the same reasons. There was a, 
an Oxfam pamphlet that uh, described the problem with Nicaragua as what they call the threat of a good example, which is exactly right. Uh, there was a threat that others might might, might uh, try to, to, du to duplicate it. Now, if you have a rotten apple that's going to spoil the barrel or a virus that's going to, uh, uh, it's going to infect others, it's necessary. you can't waste any time. I mean, an ultranationalist threat is bad enough, but a virus is even worse. Uh, and there's a standard way of treating a virus. Uh, first, you exterminate the virus, and secondly, you, you inoculate those who might be susceptible to it. So the standard response is to try to crush the criminal uh, and to impose brutal military regimes in the surrounding regions to ensure that nobody gets funny ideas. That's a pattern that's happened over and over again. Uh, so say when Cuba was a virus back in 1960, uh, the US uh, first of all invaded and then launched uh, the world's greatest campaign of international terrorism is just nothing remotely to compare with it, uh, unless maybe it was exceeded by the uh, Nicaraguan terror, uh, uh, in order to crush the virus, along with an economic embargo and strangulation and so on. Uh, and it also moved very quickly to uh, inoculate the region. So the Kennedy administration, in a historic decision, shifted the mission of the Latin American military uh, notice that if you can control the military as is required, then you can shift its mission. Uh, shifted the mission of the Latin American military from hemispheric defense, which was a hangover from World War II, to internal security. And internal security is just one of those euphemisms that means war against your own population. Uh, that was followed by the establishment of neo-Nazi style national security states all over Latin America. Uh, the big one in Brazil, and then spreading effect elsewhere, one of the cases of the domino theory that really worked, uh, to try to uh, uh, inoculate the region from the spread of the, uh, the virus, the threat from Cuba, and other techniques are used as well. Well, that's the basic structure of the, of the Cold War, of the uh, North-South conflict. Uh, if you look at the Cold War, you find it fits into that pattern very, very naturally scale aside, it's unique in scale, of course, uh, but uh, has the same, same, same structure. Uh, the Bolshevik, the Eastern Europe, Russia and Eastern Europe, are the original third world, uh, even in pre-Columbian times, back in the 15th century. Eastern and Western Europe were dividing, in fact, on a fault line that runs right through Germany. Uh, the, the West just beginning to develop, uh, the East underdeveloping, and becoming its, its service area. And that split continued, uh, continued right into the early 20th century. Uh, Eastern Europe stagnated, even continued to decline. Uh, it was deeply impoverished third world, most of it, especially Russia, uh, right into the early 20th century. Uh, the Bolshevik Revolution extracted from the third world a very big sector, not Grenada, you know, but a big part, uh, a major, uh, a major uh, uh, service area for Western Europe uh, therefore was, came under the control of uh, an ultranationalist regime, which therefore had to be crushed. And worse, this ultranationalist regime was a rotten apple. Uh, it was influencing others. Uh, there were others who got the idea that, especially in the colonial world, that they might do the same thing. Uh, and this was well understood, well understood, and it was the fundamental reason uh, why uh, the intervention was necessary. Actually, that's even recognized today by the better diplomatic historians. So the leading diplomatic historian in the United States, John Lewis Gaddis, is kind of on the liberal side, uh, in a recent book in which he reviews the history of the Cold War, uh, says that, it, that the intervention, the, the Western intervention, meaning invasion of Russia in uh, 1918 and 19, uh, was justified, as he puts it, uh, in defense against the revolution's challenge uh, to the very survival of the capitalist order. In other words, by carrying out internal changes within Russia, they were threatening the survival of the world capitalist order, of the world imperial system. Uh, how were they doing it? Well, again, not because nobody thought at that time that the Russians posed any military threat to anyone, uh, simply by the demonstration effect. Uh, and that was well understood. 
Uh, so, uh, uh, furthermore, the threat extended to the home countries as well. Uh, Woodrow Wilson's uh, Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, uh, wrote, said at the time, secretly, we now know about it, uh, said that the Bolsheviks seek to make the ignorant and incapable mass of humanity dominant in the earth. They are appealing to the proletariat of all countries, to the ignorant and mentally deficient, who by their numbers are urged to become masters, a very real danger uh, in view of the process of social unrest throughout the world. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was particularly upset that, uh, as he put it, American Negro soldiers returning from Europe might be infect infected by soldiers and workers councils in Germany in 1919. Uh, he said that he had heard that Negro laundresses uh, were demanding more money uh, saying from their mistresses, saying that the money is as much mine as yours. Uh, things were you know, really beginning to fall apart. Uh, right over the Irish Sea, uh, Lloyd George established a commission uh, 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 about Welsh miners, uh, which feared, which concluded that uh, the Bolshevik Revolution was, I'm quoting it, inflaming the hostility to capitalism that has become part of their political creed. Uh, grave danger that uh, had to be contained. Uh, so it was necessary to, to impose pretty harsh repression in the home countries as well, as in fact was done, and also to somehow crush the virus. Now the worst problem, of course, was in the third world. There you really had to tighten up. Uh, the uh, uh, first place where the United States and the West had to, were able to act uh, on this policy was in Italy in 1922, Italy was regarded as about half third world at the time. Uh, the, uh, uh, in, in 1922, uh, Mussolini marched on Rome and established the rule of the black shirts, uh, destroyed the unions, uh, dismantled the parliamentary system, uh, imposed the terrorist fascist rule. That was welcomed with great enthusiasm in the West, uh, uh, the, uh, publicly by the governments, uh, by, uh, by business, which poured money in there to uh, uh, invest in Italy. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this continued right until the 1930s. The reason was explicit. The reason was that this was the only way to bar the spread of Bolshevism. Uh, the choice was between Mussolini's fascism and uh, a, a, a workers' revolution or some other, um, you know, these, uh, what we call them, the ignorant and uh, incapable mass of humanity uh, taking over. And given those choices, naturally, we had to support fascism uh, under the rule of uh, that admirable Italian gentleman, as uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt called him in the mid-30s. Uh, Hitler, uh, his, Hitler was supported for exactly the same reason. Uh, until the late 1930s, uh, the State Department was advocating, U.S. State Department was advocating support for Hitler as a moderate, uh, a moderate who was standing between the extremes of left and right. That's one we've heard a lot of lately. Uh, Hitler was standing between the extremes of left and right. He was a moderate. I'm quoting the State Department in 1937. Uh, fascism is a natural reaction of the rich in self-defense when the dissatisfied masses with the example of the Russian Revolution before them swing to the left. Fascism must succeed, or the masses, this time reinforced by the disillusioned middle classes, uh, will again turn to the left. Uh, this is all State Department, 1937. You'll notice the kind of vulgar Marxist rhetoric, which is very standard uh, in internal uh, government documents and in the uh, business press, because they all see themselves as fighting a vicious class war. Uh, other people aren't supposed to, you know, know these things, but they're fighting a class war, and uh, they f therefore they kind of read like a Maoist pamphlet with, you know, the v values reversed. But the policies that were adopted, namely containment and, if possible, rollback, that is getting rid of them, are exactly the policies that were picked up after 1945 under different pretexts. Uh, and again, business agreed. There was a uh, U.S. business uh, decline, uh, investment declined in the 1930s throughout continental Europe, uh, stagnated in England, uh, but it rose very rapidly, in fact increased by about 50 percent in Germany, uh, where the investment climate was improved and the moderate was in control and labor was crushed 
uh, and uh, you know the threat of the ignorant masses was uh, was contained. Well, that's uh, uh, and th these policies were picked up instantly right after the Second World War. Actually, while the Second World War was going on, 1943 in Italy, the United States moved in and basically reinstated the you know the fascist structure, and that happened all over the world. A big story, which I don't have time to go through now. Uh, well, uh, as uh, 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 it c then continues uh, in following years. I should stress that as serious historians recognize Gaddis, Cannon, and others, uh, the Cold War began in 1917, 1918, not in 1945. And whatever one believes uh, about the later period, uh, there was no military threat whatsoever uh, up till the Second World War, but the virus had to be contained uh, and, if possible, destroyed and the region had to be inoculated by support of fascism, uh, for, uh, for example, in Europe, uh, uh, exactly the policies that were picked up as the Second World War came to an end. Now, by that time, the rotten apple had grown a good bit larger, uh, had included large parts of e had included East and some parts of Central Europe. That lopped off another traditional uh, service region for the West, uh, cutting off access to resources and uh, investment opportunities and so on, another traditional part of the third world. Uh, and what's more, the ability to spoil the barrel uh, also increased. Uh, as President Eisenhower put it, uh, the communists are able to appeal directly to the masses. Uh, his secretary, John Foster Dulles, uh, deplored the communist ability to get control of mass movements, uh, something we have no capacity to duplicate. Uh, the poor people are the ones they appeal to, and they have always wanted to plunder the rich, uh, Dulles said. This is all internal discussion. That's the main problem of world history. You know, the, uh, the problem is that uh, they're trying to plunder those rich men dwelling at peace within their habitations who are supposed to run things, uh, and the communists somehow can appeal to them. We find it hard to counter that appeal with our slogan that the rich ought to plunder the poor which for some reason doesn't seem to have a lot of appeal because you know, we, haven't, we haven't found the right PR jingle or something like this. <laughs>